All right, Yano and uh, Gilberto, you are on the stage now. Okay, hello everybody. <clears throat> I hope you can hear and see me. And welcome to the second Spatial Data Science Symposium. Unfortunately, is still taking place online. We still have uh, what I hope is an um, interesting program ready for all of you. But let me briefly walk you through some of the ideas and logistics behind our event here why many of you are still joining. So um, usually you would maybe talk about the slide, about the team a little bit later on the slide deck, but we only have a brief slide deck. And because we are, because we are all online, I think it's good that you know who is who and who to talk to if you run into any technical issues. So uh, this is our team. Obviously I'm one, the one, uh, Christoph Genovitz, who is doing the talking now, but uh, be sure all the, all the walking, so to speak, all the heavy lifting is done by the program chairs and um, that you see listed over here. Reju, Judith Verstegen, Linkai, Grant McKenzie, Rania Kudani, and Bruno Martins. If you want to play a fun little game and you have never seen any of us, then try to use the next minutes to match faces and um, to names here. We also have local, and in this case, this simply means virtual arrangements organizers, namely Karen Döner and Kitty Curia. And if there's anything that doesn't work the way you hoped, or the, if you have any trouble with the system or need assistance, those would be the people to talk to, and they are going to give you a hand. And well, I'm, I'm Christoph Genovitz, the general chair. So um, we envisioned this a little bit different, of course. We did the first Spatial Data Science Symposium in 2019, if I remember correctly, in the winter, so briefly before COVID, and we all met in person. It was one of those experts meeting that the Center for Spatial Studies runs here at UCSB, and we wanted to repeat this. Then COVID came, then many other things came, and we were not sure how to you know, translate the experience of a symposium to an online tool. So we went with the system over here and with three guiding principles, so to speak. First of all, we wanted to make this a, a team sport, so to speak. So it's not that we designed the program and put this in front of you, aside of a brief call for papers, because the papers are not, so to speak, the, the only thing or the main thing at this event. We also had a call for sessions where we asked you to help design the program. And I hope you will like this. There are tutorials, there are panels, there's a hackathon, there's all sorts of things. There's a, a career panel. There's obviously the interview with Gilberto in a couple of seconds. And the second one is we want to maximize interaction. So please use the chat, please get in contact, please participate. It's not one of those events where you will see only poster or paper presentations, and that's about it. So stay active if you like and if you can. And the third one, because this is a virtual event and because there's a larger audience, we have uh, 300 people that registered, in fact, a little bit more. And some of them may be sleeping right now because obviously for them it's late at night and some of them maybe up when we are, so to speak, checking out. So we wanted to make sure that there's a little bit for everybody, that it goes in short blocks, so to speak, and that whether you are a seasoned veteran of spatial data science or geoinformatics, or you are just starting your career, there's something here for everybody. Well, you be the judge whether it worked out, and please let us know. So... Let's dive into the first point of the program now because we started a little bit late until we had everybody from the tech team, so to speak, had their mics on and displays ready and so on. Namely, our interview on stage with uh, Gilberto Camara. Most of you probably know Gilberto. I guess he doesn't need an introduction. Just for the sake of me doing one, Gilberto is a researcher on geoinformatics, spatial data science, and land use in Brazil's National Institute for Space Research, where he was general director from 2006 to 12. He's renowned for promoting free access to geospatial data, very clearly, everybody of you knows this, and for setting up an efficient satellite monitoring of the Brazilian Amazon rainforest. He was director of the Secretariat of the um, Group on Earth Observations from July 2018 to June 2021. Okay, and with this, I guess we can just get into it and start it. Gilberto, do you want to say briefly hi before I before I start with our program here? Hello. Uh, 
I would like to thank you, Jan and the organizers. This is very, very, I think I'm seeing an echo. Did you get an echo as well? You are, no? you are coming across just very fine. Oh, good. So it's a, it's a big honor to talk to uh, both uh, young and experienced researchers uh, uh, of the Spatial Data Science Symposium. So uh, it is a great honor to me to be here today. Super. So I wanted to do one more thing before we officially dive into this, um, namely let you know that you can also, okay, there's maybe a little bit of an echo, maybe we can we can see who's dead. In the worst case, I can mute myself whenever you are you are speaking to better. I'm sure we are going to figure this out. I have headphones on, so I would be a little bit surprised by the echo. But you know, we are going to work it out. So, Gilberto, first of all, I, I brought you a, a wine bottle that I will hope you will enjoy. And it's from the region here, from Los Olivos. Uh, please pick it up after you talk. If you don't, I'm going to drink it myself. And for those of you where it's quite early, I asked my kids whether I can borrow an espresso machine from them. So. If you want coffee, we even have a milk steamer, then please let us know and we are going to fix your coffee. For the rest of you, just sit down, relax, and let's hope um, you will enjoy the session. So, um, Ray, you just said you can't hear me. No, you can hear me, right? Okay, let's, let's say everything works out fine, and if there's anything, then just interrupt. So. Gilberto, you may know that we are also going to have a, a spatial data science young career panel, so to speak, earlier tomorrow. Obviously, you already, you know, are further advanced, so to speak, in your incredible career, and you also list spatial data science as one of your research areas. What lessons learned would you give the new generation of spatial data scientists on their way as they start? Well. What I would first like to do, let me just try one, one issue here uh, to try to fix this. It's audio. I think if Yano mute himself while Gilberto is talking, I think that issue can be addressed. Let's try. Mute yourself, Yano. Okay. No, I don't hear the echo. So that's that's the point. So I think the, the first advice of to, to career students is uh, learn the classics. Uh, learn the classics because the classics are those where a lot of thought went into it, and it's not something that goes away tomorrow. So there are a number of classics in our area where we actually have been, let's say, developing uh, this work for a long time. So I actually have a list of suggested papers that you need to read before you die. It's a long list. For, uh, I basically would uh, ask Rui to share with everyone. But essentially, it, my advice is you need to go back to the basics of GI science, which is basically work by Egenhofer, Barry Smith, uh, David Mark, and uh, early work by Andrew Frank and Luke Anseling. And that's one part of the story. That's the basics of GI science. You would also need, because a lot of the work has been done in connection of those in spatial data science, to learn statistics. So unfortunately or fortunately, you need to go back to uh, the basics and the basics today are Hasti and Chibiani's books on elements on statistical learning and also Goodfellow's books by uh, with deep learning. And then I would argue there is a lot that has been done in connection with geographical thinking. And this goes back to Reginald Gulich's work, Dan Montello's work, and uh, more recently, Werner Kuhn's, Janos' work. And then uh, I would advise you to look at these uh, papers which, which describe semantics and ontology. They don't just don't, the questions that are raised in these papers don't go away. And they are likely to stay with us for a long time. And therefore, you are rightly advised 
to go back to the, the, the classics and, and, and read them. And reread them. I mean, for, for example, I don't know who, where, who here has, I mean, I hope that in the audience, uh, if you have not heard of a paper called Naive Geography, search it out and read it. If you never heard of a paper called Do Mountains Exist? Search it out and read it. And th this is the kind of things uh, that you would, and of course, uh, having a broad perspective is also good. So that would be my first advice. Super, Gilberto. Thanks a lot. I'm, I'm not sure that you're implying that I'm going to die anytime soon because I read every single paper that you just listed. But, you know... <laughs> Good. You know, this is an interesting point that you're making. So, let, you know, you, you mentioned the classics, and I think that the answer couldn't flow better with my next question. So, given that, you know, science these days is not only a, a global endeavor, but also a near real time endeavor, so to speak, and it's driven by these mega trends almost that come and go in, you know, hype cycles. And sometimes I get the feeling that once you're in the middle of a mega trend, all other research is non existent or non relevant. So for me and you, we can easily sit this out. We know the next mega trend is coming. Um, but if you are a junior researcher, let's say a student, a post, or maybe you're just applying for a junior professorship or you're, apply, you're getting for tenure, going up for tenure, how can you, can you avoid or how can you survive if the next mega trend isn't what you are doing and suddenly 90% of the funding and literature goes to something where you maybe don't excel? How do you, how do you weather the storm? Well, I think it's the realization that geographical information in global terms will always be relevant in the quest for knowledge. I think you have to realize that from the beginning. It's, it's not, you cannot explain the world without geographical reasoning. And whether you are doing deep learning for, or you're doing trajectory mapping or doing mobile and urban and smart cities, the basic questions of geographical thinking will be there. And because they are, in a certain sense, they are what we could call uh, unanswerable questions or un, uh, unresolvable questions of what, uh, how do you orient yourself? And for example, how does your mind represent time? And uh, why do we use uh, space uh, in terms of uh, the metaphors we have? in our language and all of this and how do we name the world which is absolutely crucial in, in climate change and environmental change times so i would argue that you should stay put if you're not in the crest of the wave because you have to be try to see where you can apply your geographical reasoning i don't think it's going away anytime soon because I think this is part of a collective mindset and collective endeavor. And you cannot just not explain the world without it. Awesome. Uh, Gilberto, not talking maybe about you personally, I know this is a little bit of a tricky question, especially if asked in front of so many people, but what do you think so far are your own major contributions, either to our profession or maybe, you know, in your case, even broader to, to society? Well, it is... I would argue in general is the application of the concepts I have learned on geospatial thinking to practical things. In my case, it's basically the monitoring of the Amazon and uh, the impacts of that in climate change, biodiversity, emissions. And, and of course, behind this, there is a lot of thinking uh, that does not become apparent because you just think, oh, this is just uh, plain old remote sensing, but in fact, there's a lot that had been gone in thinking of how you organize the data. And now we continue, this is, like I said, this is an endless endeavor, and the next generation of tools that we are developing hopefully will take us further into understanding concepts in the world. What is deforestation? What is disturbance? When is a forest no longer a forest? These are questions uh, that we, uh, just say, oh, we know, and, and when you find out that you have to do this in the context of an information system that delivers data that the Pope talks about, uh, it is quite important. I always like to joke that there are many people who believe in the Pope, but when the Pope said to, last year that 
uh, the Amazon is deforest deforestation is very high. I was very proud because I'm one of the persons that the Pope believes in. So because, of course, it's our work has been credited by the Pope and Macron or the UN Secretary General. But behind all this, there is a lot of geographical thinking. So I'm very proud of being able to use the concepts I've learned into the practical uh, terms of how, trying to save a part of our planet. I, I'm not sure whether you're seeing this, but you're getting many thumbs up here in our virtual room. Thank you. Um, so what about the next five to 10 years in terms of, you know, either spatial data science or geoinformatics? What are the big future challenges or big topics that we need to, to face or address in the next five to 10 years? Well, if you look at this, I would, I, I'm going to argue that I, I, I would not say what are the next, but at least what is one topic which I'm particularly interested in. And it's based on the issue of uh, spatial data. So uh, if we're going to discuss a little bit about GeoAI, but many of the applications of AI to graphical problems are being straightforward translations of algorithms that work for cats and dogs in Google, and we try to apply them to image interpretation of uh, satellite data. And this, of course, minimizes the what we used to say and we teach the students of spatial is special. And what actually means is that there are issues in spatial thinking that are not necessarily the same as recognizing faces in Facebook posts. Uh, a lot of our spatial thinking in terms of geography, you know, is contextual. We may say something is 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 a mangrove because of the context it is, and uh, the other point is representation, giving names to different things, and uh, this is again uh, an issue that is not well um, modeled in the current generation of uh, the knowledge uh, and the algorithms we have. And the third point, which always fascinated me, is change. You know, human spaces, geographical spaces undergo continuous changes. And again, because of that is not the target applications of, of certain uh, GOAI, it gets under-researched. So I would argue that understanding the nature of spatial data is uh, would be a significant step and a significant challenge for us all. Fantastic. So maybe as a follow-up, you talked, of course, a lot about contributions also from computer science, and obviously they are very close to us as a geographers, cognitive scientists, and so on. So where do you think will the key advances, maybe broader even for society, come from, right? We had the age of humanities, now we are maybe in the age of, 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 of computing. Which of our neighboring disciplines, whether this is geography, coxsci, computer science, where is this next push going to come from? Well, well I'm, I mean, in our close area, geographical science is going to come up with a vengeance. What we see is that many of the applications that we have, again, do not have geographical thinking and reasoning. And therefore, uh, I am going to argue that both quantitative and qualitative spatial thinking are issues that are really relevant. And I think uh, the, 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 in terms of spatial data science, of course, you have to know the basics. Okay, so you have to know the basics, you have to know your statistics, you have to know what spatial water correlation is. You, that, for me, is, is basics. So you cannot approach this without a sound knowledge of what at least underpins uh, the deep learning algorithms. But you should not stop there. Say, what do they mean in terms of this data that we leave, that we talk, refer generically as geospatial data? And that's where uh, a lot of quantitative and qualitative geographical reasoning takes place. It may sound distant words, but in fact, if we just drill down one level, they are in fact very much connected. There's one thing, Gilberto, that really strikes me as a 
as a weakness of spatial data science or GI science or however you'd like to call these communities, namely a lack for a joint vision. If I look at science funding, for instance, for, for physics, for instance, astrophysics, they all agree and they are, of course, the bigger community compared to us of what their key milestones for five, for 10, for 15, for 20 years are, you know, where, where, where they are where they're going as a community and then they get the big money behind this because then there's you know one goal and you can measure their progress. Of course, others have this as well. In bioinformatics, they often say that their big moonshot mission, so to speak, is a digital cell or an atlas, you know, almost cell by cell or cell group by cell group of the entire human body. We had a moonshot like this with the digital earth, which I think was very useful, relic money, build communities, and help to establish things like Google Earth. But but I think we need a new one. So as Moonshot for Geo AI, for instance, we propose this idea of whether we can have um, artificial GIS analyst that is going to you know perform or, or succeed at a, at a simple Turing test where you can no longer distinguish this essentially Geo AI machine executing simple GIS for you, you know, understanding a question performing certain operations in the right sequence and then giving you a map back by 2030. And the idea behind this was, you know, this is at the time we wrote this, I guess, 10 years. Can we, within the next 10 years, come up with a GYI question answering system where you say, you know, compute me this and this, or what's the answer to where should I post my, <clears throat> uh, put my solar panels and get the answer back? First of all, what do you think about about that moonshot? And what do you think about joint unifying moonshots? You know, things that are maybe a little bit over ambitious, but drive the community towards a common goal that is easy to, to communicate to the public, to funding agencies and so on. Well, that's of course a multi-million dollar question, but let me start with an analogy. While preparing for this talk, I actually uh, had, uh, I went at, I don't know how many of you know what GPT-3 is which is the state of the art in, 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 in language understanding. So I, 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 I happen to put this very, it's a simple puzzle, and uh, which is the following. There's a person, I'll call Anita because it's the name of my daughter, and she's running around a circular track, okay? At constant speed. So the two of the points will have yellow marks, okay? Two points, yellow marks. So. When uh, she started to run, Anita was closer to the first yellow mark by doing four minutes, okay? Four minutes. And then she was closer to the second yellow mark for six minutes. And then she was closer to the first yellow mark again. How does, how long does it take Anita to run one full circle? And this is a typical spatial thinking problem, right? As a circle, you have trajectories on the circle, and you measure points. And uh, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but I'm going to tell you that GPT was completely off the mark. So because he, he basically said, this problem requires translation from algebra to geometry. Anita does not travel on a straight line, but on a curve, we can pretend it is a straight line. So this is, this is the state of the art today, and you can try it at home. Uh, and it, it really shows uh, the flag of, uh, you know, a geographical thinking. It's a very simple thing. You think of a curve. So what means is the following. GeoAI has two definitions. Maybe, I mean, I read the paper by uh, Janowski, uh, by you and, and others, uh, which was quite interesting. But there is one issue here. I mean, GYI can see can mean uh, application of AI to geographical questions, or use of geographical reasoning in AI research and applications. And I'm going to argue for the second definition because I, like I said, what we currently have is that the standard, you know, by taking the state the state of the art GPT three I did this morning, and uh, you can see that it failed to do geographical reasoning. It's simple. And therefore, this is not, I mean, by, I'm not by no means the only one who's doing this. I, in fact, what happens is that a lot of people, maybe you have seen, uh, heard of Gary Marcus, 
and he has made a, quite a splash by his debates with uh, with other uh, AI gurus. And he's basically saying there's a lot that AI does, but there's a lot that it doesn't. So uh, one of the issues which has hurt, uh, at least apparently, GI science has been the following. A lot of the work that has gone on on the first, let's say, 30 30 years of GI science has been dealt with symbolic representations. If you think about uh, RCC, region connected calculus, it's a symbolic logic representation of, of certain properties and uh, so on and so forth. And, and of course, many of the ontology work is again, symbolic representations. And a lot of people said, nah, ha, ha, this is gone. Symbolic representations are gone. I'm going to do everything by vectors and transform words into vectors and do everything. And no, it works for cats and dogs, but not necessarily for forest disturbance, which means that the next generation of AI, and a lot of people are saying that, including some of the key players, is going to be somewhat hybrid. In other words, some symbolic representation is deemed necessary because uh, certain concepts are just too tough to represent in numbers. The fact that walk along a circular path is just the example I gave. And you have to understand what the circular path and you go back to the same point, that you're going to go back to the same point. And, and this is a lot of things which are interesting. So there's a lot of, uh, there's some videos that I shared uh, with uh, Rui and Yano, and he would point out, uh, which basically uh, you have uh, one example is Geoffrey Hinton in a recent last year's lecture on uh, American Association of Artificial Intelligence. You have to understand this guy won, won the Turing Prize for his contributions to deep learning. And he comes and says, well, uh, convolutional neural networks are flawed. And they're flawed because they can recognize a bus when the bus is nicely, but they cannot recognize a bus turned down. And this is one of the problems we have, for example, for accidents and self-driving cars. So uh, I'm actually hopeful, and, and I have all the reason to experience that the Turing test that you propose is relevant for the debate. We can have variation of this Turing test. My variation of the Turing test is I have a visual interpreter who's looking at an area in the Amazon and he has to decide uh, when uh, the forest has been perturbed by someone who went there and took, took fire. And this is basically a very contextual definition, but it's very similar to the one you're putting. I'm not hoping you get it by 2030, but who knows? But I think it's it's important enough to have uh, a formulation, you call it two in test, the moonshot, what you have, which clearly states geographical knowledge and geographical reasoning has to be part of the next generation of AI systems because with the current generation, we will not be able to solve a lot of problems that involve change, that involve events, that involve context of the world, which is typical things that geography and GI science have been doing all along. So I think we have, and I, I am, applaud you, Jano, for your, your leadership, because I think we have the word cut for us, but someone needs to lead the field. And I'm so proud that you are the, one of the key persons that is moving along and with your vision, you are able to formulate this moonshot or this Turing test in such a way that gives us, you know, enough food for talk and hopefully some agencies will really think, well, let me put money on this because uh, the other, we cannot just put all our money into numerical thinking. So congrats to you and the teams that are involved in GeoAI and the spatial data science. 
Well, now, now you're making me really nervous, uh, Gilberto. Thank you so much. So you said so many interesting things, and, and I think we do have a little bit of time left. So let me unwrap some of them because I think they are quite um, quite interesting. So I love your example about RCC8, so Region Connection Calculus 8 by Cohen and friends from 92, if I remember correctly. Actually, this was a tough one. And we sat down in our lab just like two years ago, and we discussed can you address the problem and create an, an RCC8 reasoner solely based on representation learning, like the embeddings that you mentioned before? And then we said, ah, that's too complicated. But, you know, I have, I have a special tool in my repository, so to speak, of course, meaning tool in the most positive sense, namely some of the most brilliant students on this planet. And I have a student, Ling Kai, she's also a co-organizer here. And she said, well, easy peasy. And she came up with something that we are going to publish in just a few days or submit in just a few days that actually shows an RCC8 reasoning capability purely based on representation learning in a hyperbolic space. But even more, not only that the system can perform um, RCC8 style reasoning, the system can also reconstruct the famous conceptual neighborhood, both of RCC8 and of Ellen's calculus, so the time intervals as published by um, uh, uh, Christian Frexer, who unfortunately you know, passed away a year or two ago. So I, I do think that the progress in these areas is dramatic, and I'm very hopeful for this. It's, but but you know, what, what strikes me as most important is just what you said, the connection between symbolic representation and symbolic reasoning and sub-symbolic representation and reasoning. So the coming together of top-down, you know, schema, ontology, vocabulary uh, um, creation, so knowledge engineering with methods from representation learning. And let me tell you why I agree with you that that's one of the most important steps. First of all, even if everything could be done purely with today's machine learning technology, which it, we, we, it you know, it can't, but this you know, these methods are also um, growing very, very quickly in terms of their capabilities. But first of all, you need to communicate this back to humans anyway. And we humans don't operate with sub-symbolic spaces, right? So that's a very clear reason for me, whether you call this explainability or transparency, or you just say, well, at the end, this information is for humans, right? The second part is that what works great about um, classical knowledge engineering, so, you know, old school axiomatic declarative AI is that you need no data, right? Once I tell you, you can't cross a red light, you, you won't cross the red light, at least, you know, if you stick by the rules. Or if I say, you know, to use our classics, uh, every every man, as they said in, in old times, is mortal, Socrates is a man, so he is mortal, right? You don't need to have 10 more examples to figure out over 100 whether that's the case. But of course, this comes at the cost of not being able to deal with noise. So I, I do think that both of these technologies will be most successful if they are closely uh, closely coupled together. But one thing also that I wanted to mention when you when you when you mentioned so explicitly geographic technologies, I think the key thing is that all these models are designed because they eat so much data as well for one unified version of the world of reality. But you know, you and me and many others here who are you know geographers or whatnot know that the way how we perceive individually geographic space is highly driven by our experience with geographic space, right? Your experience with lakes and mountains and clearly very much forests is very different than mine, right? And I don't think we are anywhere there yet to really have this, you know, emergent properties of semantics in discussions represented by, by discourse um, systems. And, you know, to close with the GPT-3 example that you gave, and the, the test I made with some colleagues some time ago was to just say, you know, ABC, somebody died, right, next day, day. And the system, of course, then comes up with the story of what they do next day because the system has no idea that once you die, you're not going to have a next day, right? It's just a language gener generalization technique, uh, which I think works superbly for writing, for writing summaries. But of course, it's not doing any analytics. It has no understanding of the real world. Would you Would you agree? By all means, obviously, because I think that you are right on on the spot with the fact that uh, I mean, the logic of emergence, which is now the next step. I think if you go to 
uh, was um, Jan LeCun's lectures last year on, on the AI. Uh, he was talking about what Facebook is talking a lot about self-supervised learning. And he's arguing that kids, you know, uh, kids uh, uh, learn by touching things and they learn volume and they learn, of course, by breaking some uh, glasses and, and dads get nervous and so on. But uh, I mean, uh, that's only part of the story because uh, not every, you have an inert things in your DNA that prepare you. Think of your DNA inheritance as some sort of, of pre-symbolic things that you know, the things that you have to touch in the sense of touching and learn by that. So uh, I am not confident. And in fact, I absolutely um, uh, contrary to the expectation that we're going to have a major, uh, let's say, jump on our knowledge representation only by improving the current generation of deep learning models and whatever. I think they will grow, but they never reach the point of what we might call this kind of thing of intelligence. Well, I, I would not argue intelligence, but I would just argue certain tasks which depend again on context, on representation, on change, are extremely hard just to learn by numerical vectors. So Gilberto, they often say that we all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? There are so many researchers that came before us that inspired us. Hopefully researchers will be inspired by us in the future. If you would have to name just two, I know you can name a hundred, but if you have to name two people who are your most important scientific influences. Who could this be? I have an idea for myself, but I would like to hear yours first. Well, in my case, uh, I'm absolutely partial because that would be Andrew Frank and Max Siegenhofer. Because, I mean, Andrew was a mentor of lots of people. Martin Halbo, uh, uh, Werner, uh, Max, me. I mean, uh, the list is enormous, uh, Stefan Winter, and so on. So uh, uh, a lot of people, and, and he was uh, great, generous enough with his time that the best things that we had were having like coffee at Vienna cafes or uh, weekends at his uh, his uh, place in Geras. Uh, yes, and, and, and Max also was very generous. So I would say to young students, it's not exactly, it really doesn't matter exactly if you are going to follow your, let's say, friend and mentor work. What actually pays that if you have the, and I had the great fortune of having two exceptional people uh, who were very generous to me. In fact, Max Egenhofen, he's younger than me, but in scientific terms, when I started, I was a late starter, so he was an important influence. And if you have profit from it, if, and the most important experiences is not necessarily uh, that go with mentoring, uh, uh, the ones that you share, your anecdotes, what happened, what happened to, you know, how do you learn things, how do you get a paper accepted, and, and how do you organize your careers. So I would say if you have uh, the fortune of having someone who is generous enough, as I had, who would take you under your arms and, and spend time with you. And I was absolutely uh, thrilled. And I'm very grateful to Max and to Andrew for, for what they did. So uh, if I would have had to guess, I would have said that you're going to say uh, Andrew as you did and and also Werner. But then I realized, you know, that's only Vienna School F. And you went with Max Ingo for that's also, so to speak, the same school. No, 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 but no, no, it's no. even more interesting because, you know, I wanted to check. What? No, I'll just say Werner jump, is a jump ahead, just inter No, no, no. Werner is a friend, a great friend. I've learned a lot, but we're like we're like uh, Andrew's uh, children, right? So we're more. He's more peer, great friend, fantastic person. But learned from, 
I mean, I, I only knew Werner later. I met Werner after I had actually worked with Andrew and Max. But Werner is a fantastic human being, and I, I'm also honored to have had to have profit from his experience. So I actually used a system that you may know called um, Semantic Scanner. And it doesn't only list like Google Scholar does all your publications and does all the bean counting that is so important to, to science these days, but it also lists your academic influences. And I was, you know, I was trying to figure out how well would it match. Obviously, it listed more than two, but it listed also these two, Max Egenhofer, so I, get, I guess it had a hit there, but it also listed Fred von Sicker, which is also quite interesting because we talked so much these days and in our interview here about, about knowledge axiomatization and ontology engineering. So I think um, Semantic Scholar got it quite right. Wouldn't you agree? By all means. By all means. Super. Okay. Now that we, the two of us, eased into this nice discussion, and, and thanks for being such a good sport about this, I have a, I have a tougher question for you, Gilberto. I like this idea, and there's a, a book about that topic, that some ideas must simply die to make room for other ideas, or because they are so dominant in our domain that if you, if you have different thoughts, if you come from a different sub-community, you are just going to be squeezed out of academia by, by these ideas or these folks. So which ideas in our domain do you think must die? Since you have been controversial in asking, I'm going to be more controversial in answering. So let's start with an easy one. The easy target is GWR, geographic weighted regression. I mean, it's a flawed algorithm. You can, I mean, lots of people have made their careers, but nothing really scientific came out of it other than GWR papers referring to GWR. So I'm not clear that, you know, it, you cannot extract any meaningful scientific properties. You cannot make a scientifically, statistically sound assertion that goes on. Now, the other one, which may come as a surprise to Santa Barbara, is geodesign. I'm absolutely convinced that geodesign is, and I can say it, so I'm not in Santa Barbara now, and it, is that it's a vanity project by guess who. And I think it also is it's based on arguments and it has no scientific plan it's no science plan it's just an idea that comes out of the blue and say oh let's do design da, 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 da. but geo design symposium but you know what is the science i mean there's no critical science point there i think these two may be less controversial than the third one with vgi volunteer geographic information and of course, it's bigger cousin called citizen science. I'm old school enough to believe that science has rules. Science is a specialized. There's things that make science science and not politics, nor argument, nor religion. And I tend to think that it requires uh, training and education and mentoring. And uh, the idea of VGI is very in the core, it is a libertarian idea. And in the sense that anyone can do science. And if you, I recently read, I recently read a review paper in IJGIS. Of, and if you look at the paper, it actually talks about other papers that talk about what VGI should do. So uh, uh, storing VGI information, uh, making sure VGI information is testable and so on and so forth. So it, these are meta papers about VGI. But uh, other than OpenStreetMap, in a very few examples, what actually happened to VGI idea was something much darker, was Facebook, Waze, and Google making sure that our volunteer, in this case, were involunteered, given the data to them, and they're using it. But they have, they know what they have. They have the science behind it. They know where they want our data to fit. But I don't think really, I mean, as a topic of geographical science or so spatial data science investigation, there's much more important bits than VGI. This is a controversial, and I'm fully aware that this is it. But this old school guy here uh, likes science done the old way. 
Well, that third one got me by surprise. But I, I do see your argument, especially if you translate the, the VGI not as a data provider, as like OpenStreetMap, but maybe as a provider of scientific insights. That's quite interesting. I thought I would be the most provocative of the two of us because I wanted to say place must die. But I think you got me with VGI, so I have to I have to think about this for a second. I you know, I I, I was hanging out uh, at another event at an AI symposium with a very well known researcher in AI, uh, Frank von Hamel, and many of you who do AI classical AI certainly know him. And we were talking about schema design, and I was invited as you know the geographic expert, yada yada yada. And then we talk about place and they said, well, let's sketch a formal schema for place and get it over. This is how we do it and so on. And then I said, being, you know, trained in this tradition of place is our holy grail. I said, wait a minute, place is this and this and this. And they start to model, you know, they're all very, very seasoned ontology engineers and knowledge engineers. And whenever they do something, I come up with an exception to say, but place is this and place is that. And somebody 40 years ago wrote about place being that and you can't do it this way. This way. And then, you know, we have a coffee break and Frank von Hamelen takes me to the side. Really, really nice guy and says, you know what, Christoph, you be careful because if you on your domain have a term that nobody understands but you and nobody can model in a computational system because, you know, it's so complicated, you're going to be damn alone in your domain. And that got me thinking. He was right, right? I think that sometimes we geographers, we make such a fuss of place being everything and incredibly complex and only understood by geographers. And every approach to scientifically model it from an outside domain must fail because, you know, it's such a difficult thing. Well, if that's the case, then it's either underdefined or we are dreaming this up and it just can be, you know, divided and conquered into smaller pieces. Or if it's really so hard and nobody can make progress about it, then, you know, your, we come back to your argument well, then it's not science, right? So, you know, that's why I wanted to, to say place. But I think your, your VGI may be striking a, a similar note here. Uh, Gilberto, before we, we wrap up, there's always one thing that I believe we should discuss first, but we always end up discussing second. And, and I apologize for this. It's certainly not because of you, but because of me. And, and that's the role of geoethics in our research, especially in spatial data science, where we deal with so many large-scale data where privacy becomes increasingly an issue. So for, for the individual next generation scholar, what do you, what's your advice for them to think about geo-AI and geo-ethics in AI early on? How, do they, how can they get their ethics right? Well, first of all, uh, I'm assuming that there is a basic understanding of ethics behind you. The, the question becomes important when you are able to actually uh, uncover unethical behavior. There's uh, uh, some of what we might call here adversarial examples. Or oh, the famous one was when Google uh, put pictures of babies, uh, and then you probably know this example, babies with mothers, and only appeared uh, white mothers with blue-eyed babies. And that was really a, a tough one. But you can buy, there are people from like, uh, I think it's Donna Boyd from Microsoft who, who has uncovered a lot of biases in, in things like using Twitter feeds to understand uh, traffic, uh, traffic and so the, the hidden biases on the data. So I'm going to argue there's a lot of thinking that would go into understanding the biases in the data and good geoethics work can uncover that. The problem and the difficulties one faced is all the examples of unethical behavior are not easily obtainable as data for research. And I'm fully aware with that. Nevertheless, whenever possible, I think there is misuse of, of geographical data, drones, this whole privacy stuff. There is a, you know, the location uh, being sold to everyone. And as much as uh, a young researcher or, or established researcher is able to uncover those biases and to show in which way data is being misused and use your knowledge to spread out the word of misuse in the data, I would argue that's an extremely important contribution to, to the society. Say, okay, uh, we're, we're thinking this is all for the good, but look at what can be done. 
So I'm going to argue that there is a lot that geoethics can do. There is a lot of scope for good and serious work in uncovering biases and uncovering, uh, let's say, inequalities in the access and use of the data. So I think the field has a lot to grow. Indeed it has, and I think that's a, that's a wonderful end to our discussion because we just hit uh, the end of our session time. So, Gilberto, this was truly wonderful. I love talking to you. I hope we will redo this in a, you know, in a longer form. And, and together, again, if, you are, if you're early and you pick this up, say, by the end of the day, I have a nice bottle of wine for you. Thank you again so much for, for being our, you know, live on stage interview, so to speak, especially because, you know, the setup is a little bit odd. I certainly had a great time. I think everybody's clapping, and I'm sure you see all the small clap hands all over the screen. And thank you so much, Gilberto. I hope you will stay around and hang around. There's a lot of discussion going on in the chat about what you said about geographically rated regression and many asking for detail. So maybe you can provide this. And I think Ray is going to, to take over now, and we are going to head into the, the coffee break, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you so, so much. It was a, a, a great honor. Thank you, Rui. Thank you, Chris. And and bye bye. And I'm gonna stay around, so I'm gonna be uh, on as a as an attendee. Hope I hope Rui can put me as an attendee, so I can interact with people and chat and so on. Sounds Kitty good. and Ray will take get yeah. take care so, of this. So everyone, we have a social lounge. We will end this session, and everyone will go to the social lounge. And at the theater, we set up several tables. And feel free to join them to chat with anyone who attended this conference. Thank you, Gilberto. Thank you, Christoph. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.